All right, friends, let's pick up right where we left off. Hopefully you just finished watching my video on the demand side of the market. And we're gonna pick up here with the supply side of the market. And then after that, we'll put the two together into a single model and talk about equilibrium. So just a reminder, supply is the side of the market that's talking about the producers of goods and services who want to sell them. The quantity supplied is the amount of that good or service that the producer is willing and able to sell at any given price. The law of supply states that with all else being held equal, there's a one-to-one -one or not one-to-one, -one, I should say, direct positive relationship between price and quantity supplied. That is, if I can sell my product at a higher price, I will be incentivized to produce more of it. If I sell my product at a lower price, I'd be incentivized to produce less of it. So in this way, price and quantity supplied move in the same direction. When one goes up, the other goes up. And when one goes down, the other goes down. This is again, assuming ceteris paribus. So one of the assumptions that's kind of happening in the background here is that the price of creating this good or service, the, the actual cost of the inputs doesn't change. So if my input cost stays the same, but I can sell my product at a higher price, that means that that margin of profit on each unit is larger. That's what incentivizes me to produce more of it when I can sell it at a higher price. When I produce, when my, when I have to sell the product at a lower price, but my input costs haven't changed, it means that my margin of profit has shrunk. And so I'll be incentivized to produce less of it. This is the law of supply. So price, when we say prices go up, we're talking about the price that you sell the product for on the market. Or when prices go down, it's the price that you sell the product for. What's behind the scenes is the assumption that input costs are the same, they're unmoving. Okay, so a supply schedule is simply the table that shows us the relationship between the price and the quantity that will be supplied. When we graph these points as ordered pairs, that's what gives us the supply curve. So let's look at a firm pure food, and they are supplying pounds of salmon. And so when the price of salmon is high per pound, they'll want to supply a greater quantity. When the price is low per pound of salmon, they'll want to supply a lesser quantity. This is the law of supply at work. Market supply, just like market demand, is simply the horizontal sum of all individual quantities for each seller in the market at any given price. So if we had two firms that were suppliers of salmon, pure food and, or pure food fish and city fish, then we could add up their individual supply given their supply schedule and get a schedule of total market supply. Now we're gonna use the same language here to distinguish between movement along a supply curve, which is a change in quantity supplied when we move from one point to another versus a change in supply, which is a shift of the entire curve to the left or the right. Changes in quantity supplied are the direct result of a change in the price of the good itself. It's simply a move from one point to another. Whereas a change in supply or a shift in supply is caused by non-price factors. This is gonna move the supply curve either to the right, indicating an increase in supply or to the left, a decrease in supply. Let's look at this example of the market for coffee. And we'll look at, this is measured in cups. So a cup of coffee, quantity on the x-axis, price on the, on the y. Our supply curve here is upward sloping or it has a positive slope. This is because we have the law of supply giving us a positive relationship between price and quantity supplied. As prices go up, we are incentivized to produce and sell more. So let's say we begin at a point where 
a cup of coffee costs three dollars and now instead of using a number i'm going to say that this is corresponding to a quantity of coffee that we're going to call q1 a decrease in supply would be caused by something of an exogenous factor other than price that would shift the supply to the left at every price like we see here for example Let's say there's a weather event like a hurricane that destroys a, a coffee crop. Then that means that there's going to be less coffee to be sold on the market. So the quantity, I mean, the, the total supply of coffee decreases, which is a shift to the left. On the other hand, an increase in supply is a shift of the supply curve to the right. This could be caused by an exogenous factor such as there's a better technology, a new way to brew a richer coffee at half the cost. And so sellers will be incentivized to sell more coffee. So this is an increase in the supply, which is a shift to the right. Let's look at each of these factors individually. The first factor that can shift the supply curve is the cost of inputs. Inputs being the things that go into the production of the final good that's sold. So these are resources in the production process. If inputs get more expensive, it means it's more expensive to produce the product, we'll have to sell less of it overall at any given price. So when inputs, when the cost of inputs goes up, the quantity supplied goes down or decreases and vice versa. If inputs get cheaper or more affordable, we'll be able to produce our product at a lower price or lower cost point. And so that will incentivize us to sell more of it. So these two things move in opposite directions. When inputs get cheap, quantity supplied goes up. When inputs get expensive, quantity supplied goes down. A supply factor um, that's also the one that we see frequently is a change in technology or a change in the production process itself. Oftentimes these are things that improve our ability to produce the product more efficiently or at higher quality. And so more knowledge about the production process or better technologies tend to help us supply more of the product. The third one, similar to the demand side factors, are taxes and subsidies. A tax paid by the producer is added to the cost of production. This is like saying the input cost went up. So when there's a tax on the producer, we'll sell less of the product. A subsidy is the opposite of a tax. This is where the government is going to pay the seller to produce the goods. We experience this as lowering the cost of production overall, and so we'll sell more of our end product. Similar to the demand side of this equation, the number of firms in an industry will affect supply. The more individual sellers means that we'll have greater market supply, and fewer individual sellers means we'll have less market supply. Price expectations affect sellers just as much as they do buyers. And so if we expect higher prices tomorrow, we may delay our sales into the future, hoping to capture those profit margins. Let's practice these things. Let's assume the price of cheese decreases. What will happen in the market for pizza? Well, cheese is an input to making pizza. And so if cheese gets cheaper, it's now cheaper to produce our end product. So we'll be incentivized to produce more of it at every price. Therefore, the supply of pizza increases. Which of the following would cause a supply curve for oranges to shift to the left? And so what we're looking for is what's gonna decrease overall supply of oranges? It's not A because subsidies actually encourage us to produce things. A study released showing that oranges improve eyesight is not going to affect supply of oranges. That's going to affect demand for oranges because that's a taste and preference. An ice storm striking Florida is an, a natural um, occurring event, which may take out a portion of the orange crop. This is a supply curve shifter, and it would shift it to the left 
because this weather event would reduce the amount of oranges available. Which of the following is most likely to cause a decrease in supply of most fruits and vegetables? So here, <clears throat> part D um, is harsh punishment for farmers who hire undocumented workers. Harsh punishments would most likely come in the form of fines. And so this is an increase in the cost of production, or in other words, an input cost, because labor is an input to producing fruits and vegetables. So if you, they're cracking down on illegal, the illegal workforce by either fining you for hiring undocumented workers or if you're just so afraid that you let go of your undocumented workers and you now have to pay more for documented workers, that both of these things are going to increase the cost of production for you. And this is what's going to decrease the overall supply of fruits and vegetables. All right, so we've got demand factors and supply factors, each of which can shift those curves to the right or the left, depending on kind of the story, the background, what's happening. When we put these things together into one single model, we know that buyers and sellers are going to interact in these markets to allocate these resources accordingly, always to its highest use. And so this is what's going to determine the overall market price or the equilibrium price. The law of supply and the law of demand are going to be what helps to adjust the price to bring that quantity supplied and quantity demanded back into balance if it's out of balance. The ideal situation, which we call equilibrium, is where the quantity supplied is exactly equal to the quantity demanded. This is a win-win for everyone. If you think about it, when they're equal, it means the amount of stuff that I've produced is all going to get bought, and the amount of stuff that people want is always available. Right, the quantity demanded is equal to the quantity supplied. This is a win-win for both sides of the market. So how do we get there? Equilibrium price will be the price that brings us into equilibrium, that is where quantity supplied is equal to quantity demanded. This is the price that we talk about as clearing the market, meaning there's no surplus and there's no shortage. We'll talk about that in a second. The equilibrium quantity is the quantity that is of quantity demanded and quantity supplied that is equivalent. So what do we mean when we're out of equilibrium? Well, there's two ways to be out of equilibrium. There's a shortage or a surplus. A shortage is a situation where quantity demanded exceeds quantity supplied. That is, people want things that are not available, right? There's more demand than there is supply for them. This is going to happen anytime the price is too low or if the price is below the equilibrium price. Because the price is too low, there's an incentive for buyers to want to buy more, but a similar incentive for sellers to want to sell less. This is how we get ourselves into a shortage. So over time, what happens is that price is going to rise towards equilibrium, right? I mean, think about in, the, in your, own ex, the own, your own market example, if there's not enough of something, people start to raise the price of it in order to reallocate it, right? So when we're in a shortage, equilibrium or prices will rise towards equilibrium in order for the market to clear. What, what happens is essentially one consumer will outbid another consumer. I mean, think about a situation where um, there's a limited number of tickets to a very popular concert. People buy up the tickets and there's still people who want them. Those people who are ticket holders will go on to third party ticket selling websites and sell their tickets at higher prices than what they originally bought them for, right? This is because the original ticket price was obviously too low and that people were willing and able to pay higher prices to access that thing that they really highly demanded. All right, so let's talk about the other way that we're out of equilibrium, surplus. Surplus is the opposite. It's a situation where quantity supplied exceeds quantity demanded. There's too much of this good available in the market and not enough people who want it. This is when you have like shelves full of stuff and it's just not selling. This is gonna happen when the price of that good is too high or above the equilibrium. 
And so what happens? How do you get rid of all that excess stuff on the shelf? Well, you put it on clearance, you have a sale, right? So the price is gonna fall over time to bring those prices back down to equilibrium and allow that market to clear. Firms are gonna lower the prices in order to get rid of any excess inventory. Let's look at this on a graph. So here, this is pounds. I don't actually know what we are measuring. What is the good here in pounds? Let's, let's say it's coffee in pounds, just for the good of this example. Okay, demand blue curve, downward sloping. Why is it downward sloping? Because of the law of demand that tells us that prices and quantity demanded move in opposite directions. That is, things get expensive, we demand less of them. Things get cheap, we demand more of them. So they move in opposite directions. This gives us a negative slope or a downward sloping demand curve in blue. Supply, upward sloping, positive slope. Law of supply tells us price and quantity supplied moves in the same direction. When we can sell at higher prices, we have larger profit margins, we're incentivized to produce more. When we sell at lower prices, we have smaller profit margins, we're incentivized to produce less. When we have supply and demand living in the same model, we are able to identify their point of intersection. This is equilibrium, where supply and demand intersect, or in other words, where the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded are equal. This happens in one and only one place. In this example, this happens at $10 per pound, resulting in a quantity, an equilibrium quantity, both demanded and supplied, of 500 pounds. Now, let's look at a situation where the price is too low. That is, the price is below the equilibrium price. You can see that $5 is less than the equilibrium price of $10. It falls below the intersection. Well, at a price of $5, we can see that point A gives us the quantity that's going to be produced, the quantity supplied, 250 pounds. At that same price of $5, if we go over to the demand curve to point B, we see that that's the amount demanded, quantity demanded is 750 pounds. The difference here is that we now have a quantity demanded that exceeds the quantity supplied. This price is too low. There'll be more people who want this good than there are people who are producing it. This is a shortage. In this case, we actually have a shortage of the difference between the quantity demanded and quantity supply. In this case, a shortage of 500 pounds. Prices will naturally fluctuate here and move upwards towards equilibrium in order for the market to clear. When there's more people that want something than there is available, prices will rise. Let's look at the opposite, a price that's set too high, $15 per pound. At $15 per pound, the quantity demanded is at point C, 250, but the quantity supplied is at point F, 750. Here we have a situation where quantity supplied exceeds the quantity demanded. This is a surplus. There's more being produced than what people wanna buy. In fact, this is a surplus of 500 pounds. So what's gonna happen? Those prices are going to fall. They'll fall towards the equilibrium to allow this market to clear so that inventory gets bought up. So let's practice what we know. Suppose that there's a shortage in a market for avocados. Shortage meaning there's greater demand than there is supply. Assuming a competitive and unrestrained market, so no government intervention, what will happen over time? Well, since there's a shortage, there's more people that want this good than there is this good available. The only way for the market to clear is to allow that price to fluctuate upwards towards equilibrium. So we should see that the price of avocados will rise and the market moves towards equilibrium in the long run. We can see here that <clears throat> you can look at the impact of a demand factor or a supply factor on market equilibrium price or quantity. So there's a lot of information on this slide. We're going to take it one piece at a time. Let's look just at this top row where the change 
is that there's some factor that increases demand. Remember, there are six demand factors and any of them could increase demand. What we do know is that an increase in demand shifts the demand curve to the right. So our new equilibrium, E2, is going to be at a higher price and a higher quantity than before. So the impact on equilibrium of a demand increase will always result in an increase in both equilibrium price and an increase in equilibrium quantity. Let's look at a supply increase. So remember, there are five factors that can shift supply. If any of them shift supply to the right or increase supply, we can see that the new equilibrium intersection, E2, happens at a point where we have a greater quantity, but a lower price. So in general, any factor that increases supply will result in a decrease in equilibrium price, but an increase in equilibrium quantity. Now, pause right here. This is not something that you should try to memorize. The graphs are here for a reason. Use your visual knowledge here to arrive at this answer. As long as you know how to set up downward sloping demand, upward sloping supply, finding that point of in intersection, which represents the initial equilibrium, then you yourself can draw in a demand curve shift to the left or right, or a supply curve shift to the left or right. After you draw in the shifted curve, you simply find the new point of intersection and compare the price on the y-axis and the quantity on the x-axis between the two equilibriums to, de to determine what the overall change will be in the long run. Use the graphs. All right, let's look at the other side, decreases. Remember, six factors, any of them could decrease demand. Decreases demand, shifts it to the left. When demand shifts to the left, we find ourselves at a new equilibrium, E2, which is a lower price and a lower quantity. On the other hand, if supply decreases, upward sloping supply decreases, shifts to the left, we find ourselves at a new equilibrium, E2, where we're at a lower quantity and a higher price. I don't know why this is like this, but let's just give it all a go. This is your summary of chapter three. This is pretty much everything that you need to remember here. We need to remember that quantity supplied and quantity demanded only change from a direct change in the price of the good itself. These are movements along the same curve from one point to another. Exogenous non-price factors will actually shift the demand curve or shift the supply curve. There are six factors for demand. Income, we have to remember whether the, price, the good is normal or inferior. Price of related goods, we have to know if that relationship is a complement or a substitute. Tastes and preferences, number of buyers, expectation of price changes in the future, and taxes and subsidies. Shortages occur when demand is greater than supply. That is, more people want it than what's available. Quantity supplied will change as a result of a change in price, but supply itself will change as a result of five factors. Input prices, the costs of the resources that you use to produce your end product technology or changes in the production process, number of sellers, expectations of future price changes, and taxes and subsidies. When supply is greater than demand, we have a surplus. There's too much inventory. In either way, shortages and surpluses over time will dwindle towards equilibrium if we allow for prices to fluctuate. When there's a shortage, prices will increase to bring us back to market clearing. When there's a surplus, market uh, prices will fall to bring us back to market clearing. This is a lot. Again, go back, practice.
practice with the graphs. We're going to do a lot of practice in class together too, but it helps to just start drawing things. Get that into your body memory of how to draw that supply and demand curve. Remember quantities on the X axis, prices on the Y axis, demand is downward sloping, supply is upward sloping, their intersection is the equilibrium. We'll talk more in class, but one thing to take away from this entire course is this model here. Supply and demand is one of the most powerful tools economists have for explaining how markets work. In competitive markets, supply and demand allows prices to adjust towards equilibrium so the market can clear. It means in the long run, there should be no surpluses and no shortages. However, we will see that there are a number of market, market settings that are not perfectly competitive, like monopoly, oligopoly, and monopolistic competition. We'll cover those things towards the end of this course, so you don't have to worry about them now. For now, really focus on the competitive market model of supply and demand, and we'll use it as our foundation going forward. All right, I'll see you next time.